I am Dr. Phyllis Mihalis, CEO of Lexa Global, and honored to moderate panel number two, Border Control and Security. My background and experiences in the environment are what excite me about this panel. Most of the past 20 years, I have operated as both the United States Army officer as well as a senior civilian for the United States Navy in and around East Africa. As the commanding officer of the United States Military Observers Blue Helmets for the United Nations mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea, I also served as the force commander's G5 and CIMIC officer. Subsequently, as a professor at the Joint Forces Staff College here in Norfolk, Virginia, I was tasked to develop the curriculum for the Ethiopian Defense Command and Staff College and am proud to have been its first instructor. The United States Navy had me develop the maritime civil affairs capabilities where we deployed teams of sailors in support of combined joint task force Horn of Africa from Manda Bay in the north to Pemba Island in the south and Comoros to the east. Concurrently, I served as an advisor and subject matter expert on maritime civic, CIMIC, and maritime security and stability to NATO's CIMIC Center of Excellence in The Hague. Enough about me. Effective land, air, and maritime border security and management is critical for ensuring international security and economic growth. Such management must allow for lawful trade and travel while preventing and countering the cross-border movement of suspected terrorists and people whom terrorists have smuggled or trafficked for financial gain, as well as the trafficking of illicit goods that may be used for terrorist purposes or financing. This panel will explore what can be done to break down border control barriers, such as limited regional cooperation and information sharing, corruption, insufficient use of technology, databases, and biometric data systems, given their importance to long-term stability and health. Each panelist will take several minutes to introduce themselves relative to this topic and event. I will then ask questions to open the discussion. The live question and answer segment for this panel is scheduled for Wednesday, October 27th from 1430 to 1500 Eastern Africa time via Zoom. We will ask you, the attendees, to submit written questions to GRV Global, which will pass them through me to take to the panelists. Without further delay, it is my pleasure to start this panel discussion off with introductions, starting with Commander Bayana. Thank you, Madam, Your Excellency. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, me to participate in this uh, very important panel. Uh, my name is uh, Commander uh, Abba Muluna. Uh, I used to be a, a policeman uh, between 19, for, for uh, 16 years with Ethiopian uh, police uh, as different uh, capacity during that uh, period. Uh, I trained uh, in Ethiopia as a formal uh, police cadet. Then uh, I joined uh, several uh, uh, institutions. Uh, the first one in the Germany. I studied uh, general policing in Germany. Then in 2000, I joined the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. So I studied there also. Uh, plus I do um, uh, I do studies uh, at Addis Ababa University in political science and international relations. I made my master's degree in international relations from Addis Ababa University. Um, another master's on managing peace and security uh, in Africa, again in Addis Ababa University. Uh, Postgraduate diploma uh, from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, since 2006, I joined the IGAD. Uh, first, as a senior uh, uh, training coordinator on IGAD capacity building program against terrorism. Then, uh, since 2010, uh, I became uh, the director of uh, IGAD uh, security sector uh, uh, program, which is responsible for counter terrorism, uh, transnational organized crime, uh, maritime security, and security institution capacity building. Uh, overall, uh, one of uh, our uh, 
uh, our area of focus since the establishment of uh, ICPAT in 2006 is border control management. So I'm familiar uh, with uh, uh, the different challenges, uh, even the opportunities we had uh, during uh, in uh, our uh, geographical uh, location. Uh, and uh, uh, during the course of the uh, discussion, uh, I will uh, share with you. I thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dave Jackson. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for giving me this chance to chat to everybody. Uh, my background is I originally trained as an Air Force pilot and I trained on the Air Markies. I was a, a ground attack pilot. And back in 1982, I was uh, invited to join the UAV program that the South African Defense Force had. I uh, subsequently joined the program in 1983 and remained with the program during the development phase while I was still in the Air Force. During that time, there wasn't many UAVs around. So we were trying to develop doctrines and a lot of the doctrines had to do with what you do within your country, but very much what you do around the borders. In 1989, I left the Air Force and I, I joined Danal, where we then moved into the sale of this product. The product was, a, was sold to an overseas uh, client. And uh, because it was just as much new to them, I remained in country for approximately 14 years. During that time, we worked in the region to try and determine how the, the product could be used, uh, mainly because most of the area that we were operating in within the region had border problems. And that is all the neighboring countries as well. So during the 14 year period, I defined doctrine for most of the countries in the area, as well as for the country we were, that we were deployed in to determine how you would use uh, UAVs combined with the remainder of your defense forces and whatever sort of service personnel that you had to, to uh, protect borders and to stop, obviously, illegal uh, operations that were occurring. Um, during that time, of course, the Gulf War broke out. So I was involved in the second Gulf War, uh, where I assisted with uh, using the same product with the NATO forces. And then also in, uh, in Afghanistan. So during the Afghanistan period, we we had to determine how to utilize the product in a different region, different environment. So mostly during the period of time that I've actually fact been involved with, with UAVs, we've been trying to define how you protect your own sovereign territories. And uh, that meant that various doctrines and technologies had to be implemented. Um, that's where I basically have spent most of my life. Thank you. Very interesting, this technology work. We'll move on now. Raymond. Thank you. Uh, my name is Raymond Kitebu. I'm the conflict early warning expert at the Governance, Peace and Security Unit of COMESA. Um, uh, before I joined COMESA, COMESA is made up of 21 member states in Africa, uh, stretching from Tunisia, Egypt, all the way to the Indian Ocean through Central Africa. Uh, before joining Comesa, I was working for IGAD. Uh, Commander Bebe Mulune was my colleague. Uh, during that time, I was a conflict journalist. And then I joined the UN, uh, two UN agencies. I joined the UN Special Office on, on the, on the uh, Advisor's Office for the Prevention of the Genocide. And then um, from there, I moved to UNDP Regional Office in Nairobi, Kenya, where I was a uh, elections conflict prevention specialist. Uh, my experience in this field, which we are discussing today, is derived from my uh, work, uh, you know, um, a station in IGAD, where we were involved in uh, developing the cross-border areas of uh, uh, what we call the Karamoja and Somali clusters, that's the border areas of Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Somalia. And then what we are currently doing at Comesa, whereby uh, we have a program which we have been uh, implementing the development of cross-border areas of DRC and East Eastern neighbors. Uh, this is uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and Zambia. And this program 
has been put in place to try to develop the marginalized uh, border areas of uh, the, 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 these regions I've mentioned uh, to enhance regional integration, peace, and stability. So I'll, when I'm presenting my points, I'll be uh, uh, focusing on the experiences that I've heard from the IGAD region and the Comesa region where, where I'm based at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting stuff for sure. Major General Masanawa, sir. You're on mute, sir. And good afternoon, all. I am Major General Masanawa, Nigerian Army. I have served in staff and command appointments. And uh, I was at one time Deputy Director of Equipment Procurement. I was Director of Innovation and Concert Development in Defense Headquarters. I was Director Policy in Defense Headquarters uh, just recently. I have been exposed to the border security, border control issues uh, for quite some time. And uh, having been a director of policy in defense headquarters, I've actually participated in a lot of series of meetings with other security agencies concerned with border management. And uh, having served also as director of equipment procurement at Army headquarters, I know the effort I have been trying to see that we acquire most of the needed technology to support our border security problems. Because really, in Nigeria, we have border problems. We have a very vast border uh, that span about 14 or 4,000 kilometers, both land and coastal. So I am actually interested in this topic passionately because of the benefit that it will be to my own country. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your comments and your introduction. Yeah. Thank you. Chris. Mr. Reynolds. Hey, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Reynolds. Um, I joined the Irish Navy in 1979, uh, mainly trained by the UK. Uh, my spe specialization inside the Navy was uh, uh, being in charge of the Navy Diving Unit, which is also covers the EOD and as a ship driver. Um, in 1996, I went to Lebanon as part of UNIFIL, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, spent a year there. Uh, during the Grapes of Wrath War, I was a convoy commander on the humanitarian convoy and uh, moving around the AO, the only convoy moving around the AO, and we were first into the Kwana massacre. So when I came home, I decided I needed a bit of a change in life. Uh, so I left the Navy in 97 and joined the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard in Ireland is a civil organization inside the Department of Transport. So for the next 10 years, uh, 97 to 2007, I was basically the principal uh, on scene commander, our incident manager for all the major disasters off the Irish coast during that decade. I left in uh, 97 and went to the National Health Service as their chief emergency management officer, uh, returning the same year into the Coast Guard uh, as the head of the Coast Guard at a tender age of 45, uh, which, seeing you, your retirement is now for 68, was a long time going to be serving in one position. So after uh, about a decade, I looked to do something uh, new. But during that period, uh, there was a lot of development in the Coast Guard. And when I was the chair of the uh, Euro, uh, uh, Chiefs of European Coast Guards and Associated Schengen Countries, I had the opportunity to put forward a policy paper on defining nations' Coast Guard functions. Uh, this paper, uh, this policy has now become EU law and EU policy as well. So that was a, uh, for me, that was a, 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 a nice thing to be able to leave behind uh, when I came out to Somalia, because after 10 years of head of the Coast Guard, I thought, time for a change. So I came out to Somalia in 2016, and for the last three years, I'm now uh, Ireland's first head of mission of a EU crisis mission. It's a, we call it UCAP Somalia, a European Union Capacity Building Mission. Uh, we're based in a number of places around uh, Somalia, we're headquarters here in Mogadishu, and our two main roles are support policing, uh, particularly policing, uh, robust policing uh, in the fight against Al-Shabaab and the change from uh, army holding to uh, police holding robust police holding and eventually to, towards community policing. And the other main area of focus we have is maritime, uh, maritime security, developing maritime police units, maritime policy, Somalia's Coast Guard function. And uh, within these two areas, there's obviously an element of border management, uh, both through connecting up the immigration to Interpol and, and CID, but also in the uh, maritime space uh, where Somalia has a lot to, lot to gain and a long way to go. 
Thanks, Phyllis. Thanks very much, Chris. Gentlemen, what a great group of uh, subject matter experts and expertise, and I can't wait to jump in. And we are going to jump into our first question, Abebe. This question is for you. Um, gentlemen, just please make sure that you're off mute when it's time. So um, I'd like to know, what are the serious transnational security threats in the IGAD region? Uh, thank you so much. Uh... IGAD region uh, is a source, uh, uh, transit, and the destination uh, of a wide range of common, uh, emerging, evolving, and existing uh, transnational uh, security threats. Actually, these threats uh, are highly uh, interlinked and interconnected by actors enabling infrastructures and uh, what you call the impact. Uh, the security architecture uh, in our region and the IGAD region has significantly strengthened uh, over the past decade, uh, but the nature and the variety uh, of transnational security threats uh, has been emerging and evolving uh, even faster. Uh, the major transnational security threats in the IGAD region uh, is number one is terrorism. Uh, terrorism has become uh, a growing problem uh, in the IGAD region, especially since uh, the arrival of uh, Al-Qaeda in Sudan since 1991. Uh, over the past three decades, uh, Al-Qaeda and its various uh, offshoots, including Al-Itihad al-Islamia, Harakat al-Shabaab, al-Mujahideen, uh, commonly known as uh, al-Shabaab, and most recently, uh, the, Islam the Islamic State uh, group have reprinted uh, a persistent and disruptive uh, threat across much of uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, other terrorist groups, including the uh, Lord uh, Resistance Army, uh, the Allied Democratic Front, uh, and NALU, National uh, Armed uh, for Liberating Uganda, have been also uh, uh, responsible for significant violence, but, but both of uh, these groups are now based uh, outside of uh, the region and impact the region uh, on relatively small uh, cases. Uh, the Islamic group uh, is another uh, threat uh, to uh, our region, uh, particularly this group uh, known as uh, Daesh uh, that first emerged in the Horn of Africa in 2012 when the splinter group uh, from Al-Shabaab uh, in northeastern Somalia announced it is change of alliance uh, and establishment a stronghold in the district, district of Kandala uh, to the east port of the town of Posaso uh, of uh, uh, Puntland, uh, led by an elderly Somali uh, returnee uh, from the UK, Abdul Qadir, uh, Abdul Qadir Munim. Uh, the group initially numbered several dozen fighters and gradually expanded between 200 to 300 uh, members in 2017. It was officially recognized by the international Daesh uh, leadership as uh, Waliat al-Somal, which means the Somali governorate. Islamic State uh, has openly declared its ambition to establish a stronger presence in Africa and has uh, built ties with local jihadist uh, groups in Libya, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique and Yemen uh, that effectively encircling uh, the Horn of uh, uh, in, uh, East Africa. There is also elements of uh, this uh, Daesh in member states in Sudan, in Ethiopia, uh, in Kenya, in Somalia. The Egad region has uh, been significantly also uh, uh, a, a significant expansion uh, in the manufacture and deployment of improvised explosive devices, also another. Uh, threat to uh, uh, our region uh, over the past decade, driven uh, primarily by Al-Shabaab. Uh, other uh, security threats is emanating from transnational organized crime, the particularly smuggling of uh, trafficking of small arms and light weapons. Basically, the major source uh, for our region is Yemen and Libya. Uh, currently, uh, Turkey joined the, as a source of small arms and light weapons uh, smuggling to 
uh, our uh, area sourced from uh, this uh, uh, region. Uh, the other one, the other security threats is smuggling and trafficking uh, human beings and uh, smuggling of migrants. Uh, the road to Europe, uh, we call it Northern uh, Road. The road to South Africa, we call it as a Southern Road. There is also emerging a new road to North America uh, because uh, you know uh, people are traveling to uh, uh, South America because Brazil and Ecuador uh, do not require a visa for short-term visits. Therefore, people are uh, particularly wealthier migrants. We call it VIP migrants, uh, taking uh, their tickets, buying their ticket, and flying to uh, Brazil uh, and Ecuador, and they get uh, their visa from that, and they try uh, their road to uh, what you call to North America, to the United States of America. The other uh, transnational security threats that we, we faced uh, that cross uh, our borders are wild animals uh, and wildlife products, particularly the ivory, uh, the pangolins, uh, the cheetah herbs. You know, cheetah herbs are hunted from our region and their destination is the Kingdom of South Africa, the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates because uh, some rich peoples uh, uh, like to grow uh, cheetah herbs like uh, domestic pet. So cheetah uh, cubs is uh, uh, transporting to, uh, to uh, the Middle East. The other problem that we had is the drugs and psychotropic uh, substances that uh, emanate from uh, Afghanistan through Balkan road to Iran, Turkey, and Europe. The Northern road moved through Central Asia towards Russia, but has declined. And the, the Southern road, which has uh, impacted the Egad region, has uh, grown in uh, uh, prominence uh, in the last decades. The Southern road is not uh, a straight track, but rather a collection of trafficking roads and organized criminal groups that facilitate uh, southerly flows of heroin uh, out of uh, Afghanistan road. There is also another source uh, of this drug trafficking is they are passing through Iran, uh, South America, like the uh, Myanmar, Laos, and Mexico. Uh, so these are uh, the serious issue. The other you have many serious you have many serious issues to say the least. It sounds like everything that all the challenges that are coming through in all these different um, dynamics are actually passing through the IGAD region, which is uh, quite a challenge for, not just for you, but probably everybody on the screen and everybody listening. Um, yeah. uh, if um, we could go on to the next question, would that be all right with you? Uh, let me finish it. Okay, have, uh, sure. A little, uh, the, 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 just to, to read the okay. issues. Okay, wonderful. Otherwise, smuggling of goods. Uh, like timber, precious stones, charcoal, and others across national borders. Uh, other issue that we had is armed organized uh, cattle wrestling, uh, where, where mm -hmm. my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Raymond, is familiar with that, the Karamoja cluster, the Dikil cluster, and the Somali cluster. Uh, there is a cattle wrestling uh, in our region, uh, plus environmental crimes, cyber crime, fraud, forgery, and counterfeiting. Uh, plus the financial crimes. This is the overall uh, transnational security threats, uh, my dear, over to you. Thank you very much. That's quite comprehensive and, and in a way very, uh, very scary. But thank you for being there and for um, helping to make a difference. Dave, we're gonna move on to you for one of your questions. Please give some examples of technologies that may be effective from a border management perspective. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, as I've been involved in, in uh, flying primarily in the UAV for about the last 40 years, um, a lot of it has been to be able to obtain data, whether it is uh, sensor type data, radar, video, photographs. Uh, it was always with the intention to try and resolve a problem, and most of the time it had to do with border controls. The problem has always been that in order to get this information to whoever requires it has always been the, the Achilles heel of any type of data assimilation that has ever been done. And it's always been a problem in order to get it there quickly. 
So if we were to use an example of using uh, video, you could get the video back to where the people were operating it, but to distribute it from there to the people in the field has always been a problem. It's easy to get it wherever you have a uh, infrastructure that allows for you to move the data around. So if we were to use existing networks, for instance, it's pretty easy to move data around, but they have to be existing. If you take the, the architecture that's, that we have to deal with within Africa, many of the, the border areas that have to be patrolled are problematic in that there's very, little, there's very little infrastructure that actually exists there. So in order for you to get any information to any user on the ground that is trying to do his, his job to protect any type of border is problematic, which means that what you've got to do is start looking at what you could do to resolve that that is actually cost effective. So we could always use satellites, very easy. Problem is within an Africa environment, that's an expensive option and the, the control and ownership of the satellites are, are not in, the, in, the, in our hands, which means you've got to look at other simplistic means of doing that. So the first thing that we have to do is we've got to look at how we can get data and transfer data through existing architecture and the existing architecture that exists throughout most of the world today is the cellular networks. The cellular networks allow us the means to do that. However, they are limited and you need to be able to get information using cellular networks to everybody. So the first thing that you want to do is to get an high resolution data, whether it be radar, LIDAR or even still pictures to the user. The problem is, of course, is, is that if you're going to use the existing architecture that uh, cellular networks allow, you've got a problem getting this massive amount of data. So I want to give you an example. So for instance, everybody knows Netflix. And you want us to wonder how on earth are they so successful to get their video everywhere. Now, not the only ones that do that. Apple do the same thing. Uh, and that is to be able to take high resolution video and send it everywhere so that you can actually fact watch your video. Now, you want to do exactly the same using, for instance, video from a UAV. How do you do it? Now, the architect, the, the, the technology that is used there is something called MPEG Dash. And the MPEG Dash is, is a means of taking video, compressing it into small sections of about one or two seconds and then transmitting it. So, from all intents and purposes, the user is actually getting a video that's only one or two seconds long. But if you put them all together, you end up with a a full video, which means that even if your architecture of the existing system that you're using doesn't allow for massive bandwidth, you can actually get good resolution through it because you're breaking it up into small little pieces. I want to thank you for that. You know, technology certainly is uh, well, it's no friend of mine. I'm not a very technological savvy person, but the fact that we, um, we have to rely on it with such, um, well, we have to rely on it so much and as the technology grows and is um, further developed, we have to hope that we can we can bring everyone along in that area. So uh, interesting, um, interesting um, example with the Netflix. Um, and thank you for showing me that I was on mute. That happens far too much. Um, let's move on now to uh, Raymond. OK, we can do that. What are some of the yeah. main challenges facing border security in your region? Yes, uh, my colleague, uh, Commander Bebe, has covered most of them, but I'll just uh, bring out some of the, the others that he has not brought out. Uh, one of the challenges is border, uh, weak border control and management uh, systems. As you know, most of our borders are in very uh, remote areas, marginalized and underdeveloped. So you find in these areas that the necessary equipment and, uh, and control measures are lacking. Uh, combined with that is the issue of uh, capacities of border officials. Uh, we are talking about border customs, uh, officials, migration, and all that. They don't have, some of, most of them, like I've witnessed, don't have the necessary capacities to uh, manage uh, effectively uh, issues to do with border crossing, uh, you know, uh, inspection, and all that. And then we have another big challenge, which runs across the region, uh, which has impacted on the ability of a uh, the management of borders, and that is to do with border disputes. When border disputes are taking place, you find that member states are not effectively developing these border areas, and then that allows for 
uh, you know, smuggling, uh, the, the, the conduct of uh, transnational crimes like human trafficking, drug trafficking, like Commander Bebe has mentioned. And then we have the issue of um, um, uh, the issue to do with the non engagement by member states on close co closer cooperation uh, to, to enhance border security and uh, joint development of this area. So these are the main challenges that I think are impacting on the ability to provide border management and security. Thank you. Thank you. The topic of border disputes is very interesting. I quite honestly, I think more about the main entry points or the main trans um, transfer points between borders. And I, I guess I don't think as much about the, uh, the challenges in the remote border uh, areas. So um, I think maybe we'll, hopefully we'll get a little more time to talk about that as we go on. Uh, the next question is for Major General Masanawa. Sir, how could the use of technology enhance border management in an environment with the 4,000 kilometers of borderline? Please make sure you're off mute. My question is, I need help from the panelists, from the members of the panel. So what would you like to, what would you like to ask of them? Yes, I say, how can the technology help us cover our wide um, border spanning about 4,000 kilometers, both land and uh, coastal border, considering the fact that uh, human beings, as a security, border security agencies, cannot be adequate enough to cover this wide border. Are you hearing me? Gentlemen. Hello? Yes. We, Gentlemen, we can could we, anybody okay. have a um, um, response to that on yes. ways and strategies in which a 4,000 kilometer border, which would be both land and sea, uh, we, could, yeah. uh, we could help to manage that? Yeah, yeah, yes, can I yes, take Raymond. Point? Yes, so one one of the one of the uh, solutions would be to enhance the, the involvement of the border communities uh, in managing the border, that long border. Uh, most of our borders are porous, but it, what we learned from the Igad region is that you have to involve local communities, local administrations, so that they can uh, help the states in terms of managing who is crossing the border, what kind of goods are passing through the border, and what kind of services also passing through the border, and they need to be cleared. So involvement of the local border communities is quite important. They will play a role in terms of even providing the early warning information on what is being done illicitly and also what needs to be done to address emerging threats. The other thing would be the usage of a, or application of smart technologies. Uh, we have the issue of uh, drones. Drones are effective in terms of uh, providing the monitoring of uh, what is happening at the border areas and also uh, submitting the necessary early warning information. We have GIS uh, uh, technologies. We have uh, vehicle tracing uh, 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 technologies. All these are smart technologies that will help uh, the border, 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 border institutions, the security agencies in terms of uh, ensuring uh, law and order in these uh, remote areas. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I think that that was a very, uh, that's a very pointed question, sir. And I'm, I'm glad that you asked it because as we're moving forward and I wanna jump to the next question, which I think will help provide an answer to that question, sir. When we talk yeah. about the, uh, what do you do when you have such an, ex such an extensive border, both land and sea with porous, th that's porous no matter where you are. I'd like to jump now to Mr. Reynolds who, I think um, uh, I'd like to narrow it down to his specific area and perhaps what the strategies are in their area may apply to you. So Chris, what are your specific you. challenges in maritime security? Let's look at the maritime side of this in the Somali Basin and the Gulf of Aden. Okay, um, I suppose from a strategic uh, um, view of EU's interests in Somalia, I think it has two main uh, interests. One is, is it needs to keep a stable Somalia uh, to prevent the rest of the Horn of Africa collapsing and instability spilling over into Kenya, uh, Ethiopia and uh, Djibouti for various reasons, uh, both military and non, and non military and around migration. So the second strategic interest that it has is maintain, maintaining freedom of navigation. And that's 
what uh, international fleets have been doing since uh, the beginning of piracy off the coast of Somalia. Uh, although piracy is gone, uh, the pirates and the kingpins have not gone. They simply changed their, their, their modus operandi. They changed their, their uh, work model. Piracy became too expensive from a human life point of view and from a risk point of view. And so they've moved into uh, criminality. And we heard some of it uh, uh, before from Micah. So today I was reading the uh, confessions of an al Shabab uh, uh, terrorist who'd been captured. And uh, uh, it was interesting to read. He had his GPS, and we were able to extract from GPS uh, where he'd been. And he'd been all over Yemen uh, by sea, uh, collecting weapons, probably collecting fighters, and then running across, uh, as was mentioned, to the area around Kandala, which is uh, east of, of, of uh, Busasso. Uh, and he was then uh, arrested uh, in Puntland and, and is currently detained in Puntland. So the reality is, if you have got a 3,300 kilometer uh, uh, coastline, the longest coastline on continental Africa, you cannot blockade it with naval fleets. The concept of having naval fleets blockading a country that big is, is, is not possible. It's not possible. If you want to put it in, in perspective, if you took the bottom of Somalia and put it on the, on the toe of Italy, the corner at the top corner of Somalia would turn somewhere in Finland. That gives you perspective about the length of coastline that I have here. So they have numerous challenges and part of our mission is to try to help them uh, address that. And that, that's a long-term issue. The, the maritime challenges they have are that there is uh, widespread smuggling across uh, weapons, fighters, and drugs coming in, heading to the Ethiopian and Kenya, uh, the, the drugs doing, and then uh, irregular migrations and human trafficking going the other way. Um, because of the nature of the society in Somalia and the level of corruption there is here, it's very hard to have a all nation uh, response to this uh, problem. So what you have is you now have the various federal member states looking to set up their own regional security forces, including maritime entities, to manage their own areas. In the absence of an of, of agreement, a political a revenue sharing agreement, and, and basically a, a, a clan issue between the federal government and federal member states. So while this is going on, uh, Somalia's ability to move forward to develop a blue water force is very limited. The other issue that Somalia, of course, has is affordability. Um, in the EU, we've always pushed Somalia to develop a Coast Guard, not a Navy. Uh, a Coast Guard is a simpler concept. It's a cheaper concept. And most of the, uh, the problems Somalia has in its waters, in illegal fishing, in, in migration, and charcoal, and sugar smuggling, are really Coast Guard functions, Coast Guard tasks, and not necessarily military tasks. And uh, I have to be honest, we, we've more or less given up on that. Uh, and I put it back to the fact that one, the Somalis are very, very proud of their naval heritage. They were once uh, one of the biggest navies in Africa and one of the most powerful navies in Af Africa in the Russian days. And the second is they can't afford the Navy and the Coast Guard. So they already have Turkey training naval officers. We're now moving to try to help develop a, a Navy and Coast Guard for Somalia using what I mentioned earlier, the Coast Guard functions as a way for the Navy to enforce civil law on the waters. But there's many bad and good actors in the maritime domain. Many spoilers uh, around us as well, because there's regional influence here. A lot of regional powers uh, want to have influence in the Horn of Africa. And uh, with a destabilized uh, Somalia, it did more effect and can have more influence in having access here. We've seen there is a, a, a large uh, um, influence by uh, UAE in the north, and there is a, a who, are fun, who are funding and helping fund maritime uh, forces in the north of Somalia. And we have a uh, Qatari and Turkish interest uh, further south down from, uh, down from the, in, in the, in the uh, Somali basin. So while you have these conflicting, and Ch obviously China is very interested in getting here as well. Um, so while you have all these conflicting um, messaging and funding streams and political games, uh, the ability of Somalia to enforce its own maritime security is, is quite limited. So we're looking at 
this being for our, at least our mission helping Somalia being a, a 10 year concept. Thank you. The other uh, element that is affecting maritime security, of course, is their relationship with neighboring states. Uh, although they have probably a fairly good relationship with uh, Djibouti, uh, their relationship with Yemen is not developed, and Yemen is where a lot of the instability is coming from. And we've seen last week uh, the International Court of Justice has ruled principally in favor of Somalia in the maritime dispute, and we expect that that will further destabilize the maritime domain uh, in the coming time until we see what actions Kenya uh, uh, takes against the ruling, which is rejected in totality. So maritime security is, is a very complex matter. Uh, you have federal member states and federal governments trying to furrow their own uh, uh, road into developing their own maritime forces based around what revenue they can get out of it. But we're hoping that there will be a, with a new government, the new government comes in, there will be a greater focus on the blue economy. Uh, there's never a famine at sea, there's never hunger at sea, there's lots of fish out there, there's oil and gas. So Somalia uh, looked at it as being a principal form of revenue for themselves going forward. They need to develop their blue economy. And you can't grow blue without protecting blue. So our hope is that when we see the uh, new government and the shape of the new government and how well that new government put, puts both um, the uh, relationship with the federal member states and also his interest in the sea, what priority he gives that. And that's the messaging the EU will be giving to them uh, when they come in, that we may see some better movement forward uh, of maritime security in Somalia. Thank you. That, that's quite an interesting uh, compilation of information, looking at it from the various aspects of what I would refer to as instruments of power, where we're looking at the different um, types of uh, strategies. I mean, strategies are not just one way. They're not just a military or diplomatic or law enforcement, but it has to be a, um, a whole of government or a whole of community approach. And sir, I think that uh, maybe that's part of the answer is that there are so many different elements that have to come together that combine to try and come up with one solution. Uh, I know that we're getting short on time for a few of you. Um, I would like to throw out a question I have to the group because you are the subject matter experts. I'm sitting here on the East Coast of the United States and certainly uh, that is not what I would call a field experience right now. But um, I would like to know what unique challenges to border control and security you have each seen. And if you could do this briefly because we're, we're coming close on time, what um, that you've seen as a result of the global pandemic. So not only do you have your what I'll say your, your usual challenges, porous borders, technology challenges, uh, regional cooperation issues. Have you all seen, or what have you seen, or what do you think of as the unique challenges, or is the pandemic just another challenge to be dealt with? So I'd like to, I, I'm looking at my screen. So Raymond, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you, thank you. Um... Uh, what I'll start with say uh, about the, 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 the unique challenges brought about by the pandemic uh, is the issue of uh, uh, border closures. The pandemic has brought in uh, border closures because member states had to respond to it by restricting movements. So most of our member states uh, in the commercial region closed borders. When they closed borders, this affected the movement uh, even across the borders, trade in goods and uh, services. It also affected the ability of the board officials to manage the borders, uh, even for the security agencies to move and police the borders because there were curfews, they could not move, uh, tra uh, transportation was uh, affected. And then some of the criminal groups we saw took advantage of that to, 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 to kind of involve, uh, get involved in illicit uh, activities, smuggling of contraband, uh, you know, human trafficking and all that. So the border closures brought about by the uh, the restric restrictive measures put in place by member states emerged as a unique challenge uh, in our region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abebe. How uh, how have you seen this? It, it, is this just just another challenge to be put on top of the already existing challenges, or is there something unique about what the uh, what the pandemic has resulted in your uh, in your strategies? Yeah, actually, uh, actually, the pandemic, uh, the, the, this movement of people, uh, particularly uh, the, the closure, 
uh, uh, mostly focus, you know, this the air travel one. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at it, the borders, uh, the, the majority of the African borders uh, inherited from uh, colonial legacy, there are pe people are living in different uh, uh, country, the same people living in the, in, the, in the same, in different country. Therefore, African borders characterized into two. The first one, there is a state border. The other one is there is people border. So the, we cannot, we cannot, uh, you know, stop the people border, the movement of people, uh, the same people. For instance, the Boronas from uh, from both sides of Ethiopia and Kenya, the Somalis from both sides of Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Djibouti, they can move in. The Afars also the, the same thing. So. Uh, the actual uh, problem, uh, the existing challenging problem, uh, is the, uh, the the you know the the issue of uh, weak state apparatus in the border community, the institutional weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, that that one is a very uh, serious uh, issue in terms of skills, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, border control. Uh, uh, arrangement, this kind of issue is a very uh, challenge uh, to uh, our region. Thank you, thank you. Institutional weakness, uh, that's quite a phrase. Um, General, how about you? In your particular situation, have you seen where uh, the pandemic has uh, made things more of a challenge, just a different challenge? How is that affecting your, uh, your particular environment? Well, actually the pandemic led to the declaration of lockdowns and restriction of human activities. It also transformed the whole world, not only Nigeria, to change their working patterns and movement of people were actually regulated with new protocols. Manifestation of quarantine, contact tracing, social distances, all those things were somehow enforced by the presidential task force. However, the lockdown forces inflation and increased cost of living. Jobs were lost, businesses lost customers. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, no, I, I'm just, oh, I'm oh. making, I'm make, actually making notes. Uh, I oh, think that's okay. an interesting, I think that's an interesting perspective is, um, okay. a, a, and I don't know that it's unique to your area, which is, I think that's probably yeah. good that we all are experiencing some of the same things. Of course, there are a report of, sorry, let me add, there are a report of criminality in some part of Nigeria due to recruitment of unemployed youths by the criminal syndicates. We have those issues. Equally, the enforcement of the lockdown also were accused of compromising and collecting bribes to allow movement, thereby undermining the potential task force that were enforcing the lockdown. Additionally, the uh, well, all the embassies were closed down. So people migrating to Europe and uh, wherever, some of them were cut off by the lockdown, and that also had effects. Some Certainly. of them would enter into difficulty, particularly the women. Eventually, went into either they were abused or they went into prostitution. So those are some of the effects of the lockdown. Equally. Uh, illegal immigrants will always try to find their way, but at the end of the day, they were caught up with the lockdown, like I said earlier, and with associated consequences to them and even to their family. That's all I think I have. For... Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting short on time, but Dave, I'd like you to get, uh, get your um, thought on this. Is in your particular um, area, where are you seeing, if anything, um, challenges, new challenges with the pandemic? Well, for us, there's, there's not a, a, a new challenge, but I think we, we actually haven't uh, resolved the problem of how to look after your border, whether there's a pandemic or not. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion of all the problems that exist, but we, we actually haven't looked at what you could do to try and resolve it. And I think that uh, what's very evident is that there's, there's a lot of information out there but in order, in order for us to come up with some sort of solution to try and resolve border issues, we, we need to look at how to solve it. And I think the, the first thing that's very evident is there's so much information, but is there data centers per country that in actual fact pull this information together to start 
looking at how they could use that information uh, in order to resolve problems. Then you can use technology after that to start looking at it. And whether there's a pandemic or not, the technology still exists to try and help. So for instance, if you, if you wanted to, to do something on the border, to patrol it or whatever, you're still going to need to do that, whether there's a pandemic or not. So you know, although my, my expertise is in the, in the airborne reconnaissance, where they you use of aircraft and, and UAVs, whether you fly over the sea over the land is is irrelevant. You can do the job anywhere. I have flown missions that are thousands of kilometers long and been in the air for for you know in excess of thirteen hours in order to achieve this. But unless we're able to get information to the people that need to make the decisions, we're not going to get there. And I think that's for me. Uh, a problem that's not, not really being addressed at this stage. The, the pandemic from, a, from a, a, a UAV perspective is irrelevant. UAVs are not affected by it. The people are. So which means that we need to look at how you can operate uh, doing border patrols with minimalistic people being able to get the information to the, to, to the, the people that need to make the decision. An example is, is that the Nigerian border is big which means that you would need a lot of aircraft if you wanted to just patrol the border, ignoring the fact that you're going to need a hell of a lot of ground forces in order to implement some sort of control on the ground. But it is possible. The problem is, is you still can't get the information to that soldier or that patrol or that platoon on the ground to make the decision so that they can in actual fact do their jobs. An example that you could solve for that, which has been done quite easily, is to might create an airborne uh, and cellular network system. Why? Most soldiers have got cell phones today. It's almost a way of life, which means if you create an airborne cellular network for an aircraft that can stay in the air for 20 to 30 hours, you have the means to be able to transmit information to them directly. But also because it's on an airborne cellular, it can integrate with other cellular networks, which means that without terrestrial networks, you can in actual fact get the information to the decision makers. That's the type of thing that we shouldn't actually be discussing. That's that just um, opens up all kinds of other questions. But you know what? We, I believe, are running out of time. I need to wrap this up as quickly as possible. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough. I have made notes upon notes upon notes. And I'm just uh, excited to have heard from each of you to hear your challenges, some of your solutions, some of your questions that are still open ended. And I wish this panel could go an extra hour or two. For you, those of you that are attending and watching us, whatever your questions may be, please send those back through GRV. And we will then give them back to the panelists. And uh, we will see you, um, I believe it is for the question and answer session on Wednesday, October 27th, from 1430 to 1500 Eastern Africa time which makes it a little early here for me on the East Coast, but I love it. Uh, so again, thank you each of you gentlemen for everything that you've given us today. It's a lot of stuff to think about. And uh, institutional weaknesses is one of the phrases that I keep writing down here. Um, I think if we could solve that, then there would be a lot of solutions to a lot of our challenges. Again, thank you very much. Everyone have a great day. Be safe. See you soon. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, colleagues. Bye.